Hello, I'm Robert Lustig. I'm a pediatric endocrinologist and obesity researcher. And I am going to talk to you today about all of the diseases listed here. Uh, this is a very long list of chronic diseases, but they all have one thing in common. They are all made worse by sugar. So we're going to talk about the role of sugar in chronic disease today. Uh, I do have these disclosures. I did write these books for the general public, most recent of which is Metabolical, The Lure and the Lies of Processed Food, Nutrition, and Modern Medicine. And I am also the chief medical officer of four companies and a paid advisor to four other companies. I will not be discussing any of these companies or products during this discussion today. Uh, it starts here, it starts with this fiction. Uh, this was a uh, uh, video that was uh, displayed uh, in 2013 on every football game in America, uh, sponsored by Coca-Cola called Coming Together. And this is a direct quote from that video. Beating obesity will take action by all of us based on one simple common sense fact. All calories count no matter where they come from, including Coca-Cola and everything else with calories. So you can get your calories from carrots, so you can get your calories from kumquats, so you can get your calories from Coca-Cola, or you can get your calories from cheesecake. It doesn't matter because it's energy balance. Therefore, it's calories in and calories out. Therefore, it's two behaviors, gluttony and sloth. Therefore, uh, any calorie can be part of a balanced diet because it's diet and exercise. Therefore, don't pick on our calories, pick on somebody else's calories. All of this comes from the notion that calories are fungible. That is, it doesn't matter where they come from. The problem is the science says something else entirely because the science says that some calories cause disease more than others, depending on which foods they are in because different calories are metabolized differently because a calorie is not a calorie and sugar turns out to be the most egregious of all calories. So you know that this is true. The question is, is this true as well? And we now have the data to demonstrate that indeed this is the case. Now, the public health community says that in order to regulate a substance, it has to meet four separate criteria unavoidability or ubiquity, toxicity, abuse, and negative impact on society known as externalities. In other words, how does your smoking affect me? Or how does your alcohol use affect me? So that's the question for today with sugar. Does sugar meet these four criteria? So we're going to go through each of these one at a time. So from an unavoidability standpoint, well, it's in all of our food. Now, our ancestors back in 1820, getting fruits and vegetables and occasional honey, you know, consumed about five pounds of sugar per year, which is virtually nothing. And there's the growth of the sugar industry during the uh, late 19th century, c and and Domino, et cetera, uh, Texas, Louisiana, Hawaii, which reached stabilization there at the beginning of the 20th century when price equal demand, there's the rationing of World War II, came back up to the same level. And then we had the advent of processed food in the mid 1960s. And then we had the switch for of high fructose corn syrup for uh, sucrose. And we also had the dietary guidelines, which caused an increase yet again. All right. So if you look at our diet, it turns out that 56% of the food sold in America is currently ultra processed that it means different nutrients, different ingredients that are taken out of other foods and put into virtually new created foods. Uh, this accounts for 62% of the sugar in the American diet and 67% of the sugar in kids' diets. And as you can see, it's in virtually all foodstuffs, uh, not just the obvious candy cakes desserts. All right, so ubiquity solved. Now about toxicity. Now, this article you may have seen in the New York Times Magazine about now uh, over 10 years ago from Gary Taubes, is sugar toxic? And our response uh, in 2012 in Nature, my colleagues, Laura Schmidt, Claire Brindis and I wrote this uh, article in Nature called The Toxic Truth About Sugar. 
And the question is, you know, were we, you know, guilty of hyperbole? Did we really mean it? Well, the definition of toxicity is the degree to which a substance can damage an organism. Now, notice it does not distinguish acute toxicity from chronic toxicity. So we have acute toxins like sarin and ricin and VX gas, um, cyanide, you know, parts per billion, keel over and die on the spot. We also have chronic toxins like benzene, carbon tetrachloride, tobacco, smoke, pollution, etc. Okay, they're still toxins. They just don't kill you immediately. So one cigarette won't kill you, but 10,000 might. And that's what we're talking about with sugar. We're talking about chronic toxicity. Now, in order for me to demonstrate this, I must show that sugar is an independent risk factor and that it is exclusive of its calories. Otherwise, calories are toxic, and that's not true. And it has to be exclusive of weight gain and obesity. Otherwise, obesity is toxic, and it turns out that's not true. So the first problem, the first thing to understand is that fructose, the sweet molecule in sugar, the molecule we seek, the molecule that makes it sweet, is not glucose. Glucose is the energy of life. Every cell on the planet burns glucose for energy. Glucose is so important that if you don't consume it, your body makes it, all right? Fructose is another story. Fructose is completely vestigial to all vertebrate life. There is no animal cell on the planet that requires dietary fructose for any purpose. And it turns out fructose has some very specific properties that are not shared with glucose. Fructose is seven times more likely than glucose to form what we call advanced glycation end products. These are the, it, this is the browning or the Maillard reaction, and this causes chronic disease. Fructose does not suppress the hunger hormone ghrelin. So if you take a child and you pre-treat them with a soda, and then you let them loose at the fast food restaurant, they don't eat less, they eat more because the 150 calories in the soda didn't register. Acute fructose does not stimulate insulin and therefore it doesn't stimulate leptin, except it causes insulin resistance, which is even worse. And hepatic liver fructose metabolism is completely different from that of glucose and chronic fructose exposure alone causes all the diseases of metabolic syndrome. And that can be seen here. This is a liver cell. And you can see what happens to glucose when it enters the cell. Pretty much all of it ends up with that big arrow going to glycogen or liver starch. This is what your liver wants to do with excess energy. This is why marathoners carb load before a race is to increase their stores of liver glycogen. And glycogen for the most part is good. Very little of the glucose will actually make it down to the mitochondria where it will be burned by the Krebs cycle or the TCA cycle to create ATP and carbon dioxide. And even less of it will get thrown off via a process called the citrate shuttle here where citrate will ultimately be turned into fat VLDL by these three enzymes right here, ATP citrate lyase, acetyl-CoA carboxylase 1, and fatty acid synthase. This orange pathway here is known as de novo lipogenesis, new fat making. This is what happens to excess carbohydrate that enters the liver that the liver can't handle. Well, turns out only a little bit of glucose will make it to fat. Conversely, fructose, you'll notice no glycogen. All of it ends up down at the mitochondria. Therefore, there's an overwhelming of your mitochondria. The citrate leaves the uh, uh, mitochondria through this citrate shuttle. And then there's plenty of substrate in order to form VLDL. Some of it will make it out and that will ultimately lead to either cardiovascular disease or obesity. Some of it will precipitate as a lipid droplet and that causes liver dysfunction, causes insulin resistance, as you can see here, hepatic insulin resistance. And that hepatic insulin resistance drives excess insulin, which drives hypertension and drives uh, 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 the, the brain to not be able to see uh, its uh, leptin signal, which would tell it to stop eating. And so this accounts for the overeating and the chronic diseases associated with sugar consumption. But that's not all. There is a second problem, and I mentioned it before. Here are five pictures of food. They all share one thing in common. They're all brown. Now, the common link is this 
Browning reaction or the Maillard reaction or non-enzymatic glycation. So here's the way to think about it. You can roast your meat for an hour, 375 degrees, or you can roast your meat at, for, uh, at 98.6 degrees for 75 years. All of us are browning all the time. And the question is how fast, because the faster you brown, the quicker you die. And it will prove to you, you are browning right now, because here we see newborn rib cartilage, nice and white, and here's 88-year-old rib cartilage, nice and brown. We are browning as we speak. It is part of life. It, 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 the only way to stop the browning reaction is to be dead, all right? You can't stop it, but the, you can slow it. And the way you slow it is by, get, by uh, providing substrates that don't engage in it as fast. It turns out glucose engages in it relatively fast. And the, this is the uh, biochemical reaction itself. This is the aldehyde portion of a glucose molecule binding to the amino group of a hemoglobin molecule and ultimately leading to this covalent linkage, which we call hemoglobin A1C. This is what diabetics measure in their blood. And the more they make, the higher their blood sugar is, and also the quicker they die. Well, it turns out fructose does it seven times faster. And every time it does it, you get cell dysfunction and death. You release a reactive oxygen species, an oxygen radical, which can damage the cell even further. We have shown that increasing sugar availability within any country increases diabetes prevalence. So every extra 150 calories per person per day that's available within any country's borders increases the diabetes prevalence of that country only by 0.1%. But if those 150 calories happen to be a can of soda, then diabetes prevalence is increased by 11 fold, 1.1%. And we're not consuming one can of sodas worth of sugar, we're consuming two and a half cans. So take that up to 2.4%. These data actually meet the criteria for causal medical inference, the same level of proof we have for tobacco and lung cancer today, because we've shown dose, the higher the dose, the uh, quicker the diabetes, duration, the longer the exposure, the quicker the diabetes, directionality, those countries where sugar went up, more diabetes, those countries where sugar went down, less diabetes, and finally precedence. Whenever sugar changed in a country, Diabetes changed in the same direction three years later. We dem uh, have demonstrated that approximately 25% of diabetes worldwide and 29% of diabetes in America is explained by sugar and sugar alone. We've also done a, a placebo controlled trial to demonstrate that sugar is toxic unrelated to its calories. What we did was we took 43 children from our own clinic at UCSF and we took the sugar out of their diet. We studied them on their home diet first and showed that they were making lots of fat in their liver and lots of VLDL. And then we put them on an isocaloric, that is same number of calories, sugar restricted diet. Now, if you take the sugar out of somebody's diet, you have to put something else back in, in order to keep it isocaloric. We gave them starch. So it was a starch for sugar exchange. And what we showed was that in 10 days, we were able to reduce liver fat by 22%. We were able to reduce that de novo lipogenesis by 46%. We reduced their VLDL by 49%. And their insulin started being released appropriately and normally from their pancreas. In other words, we reversed their metabolic syndrome in 10 days with no change in calories and no change in weight. This has now been independently confirmed by another group from Emory University and UC San Diego. Also, this fatty liver disease is a huge problem. As you can see, adolescent fatty liver disease increases the risk for type 2 diabetes over control by 2.6 fold. So if you have fatty liver and currently today, 25% of uh, adolescents have it and 45% of adults have it, you're at risk for type two diabetes because your liver is sick. This brings us now to the question of, well, the sugar's in ultra processed food, but the sugar and therefore the ultra processed food is making us sick. 
but it's food, right? Well, is it? Is ultra processed food actually food? So the question I'm asking is, well, what's the definition of food? Well, if you go to the dictionary, here's the definition. Substrate that contributes to growth or burning of an organism. Does sugar meet this uh, definition? Well, let's look at burning first. All right. This is a study done at Joslin Diabetes Center where they showed that glucose, the energy of life, stimulates the enzyme that tells mitochondria to work. And it also stimulates one of the enzymes in the mitochondria called hydroxyacyl-CoA dehydrogenase. So beta oxidation of mitochondria is increased by glucose. Okay, glucose is food and it causes burning. But fructose, on the other hand, that sweet molecule in sugar, it suppresses these genes. It suppresses AMP kinase. It suppresses this enzyme here called ACADL, acyl-CoA dehydrogenase long chain. It suppresses this enzyme here, carnitine palmitoyl transferase 1A, which is necessary to get uh, uh, fatty acids into the mitochondria for beta oxidation. Fructose actually reduces burning. Well, if it reduces burning, is it food? Ron Kahn, the head of Jocelyn Diabetes Center, said about this study, the most important takeaway of this study is that high fructose in the diet is bad. It's not bad because it's more calories, but because it has effects on liver metabolism to make it worse at burning fat. As a result, adding fructose to the diet makes the liver store more fat, fatty liver disease, and this is bad for the liver and bad for whole body metabolism. Another study done by Dr. Kevin Hall at uh, NIH looked at patients who were in a uh, room calorimeter uh, where they lived there for a month and were fed either an unprocessed diet or an ultra processed food diet that was matched for all the different components of food. And what they found was that when they were eating the ultra processed food, they were eating 500 calories a day more and gaining weight compared to the unprocessed where they were actually losing weight because their mitochondria were not working. They were not burning. So burning is a problem. How about growth? Remember you need growth or burning. Well, this is a study done by my colleague, Dr. Efrat Monsenigo Ornan from Hebrew University, Jerusalem, showing that cortical bone is being laid down appropriately in the control situation. But look what happens with an ultra processed food and sugar diet. And you can see that all the bone is being washed away compared to control, and it's being thinned as well. And in fact, what ultra processed food does is it actually hijacks the growth paradigm to increase cancer formation. Every 10% increase in ultra processed food consumption increases risk of cancer by 12%. So not only are you inhibiting growth, you're actually hijacking it. Thus, in fact, sugar and thereby for by proxy processed food is not food because it doesn't meet the criteria for either growth or burning. In fact, processed food is toxic as demonstrated by this Newsweek article. Okay, how about abuse? Well, National Geographic summed it up very nicely. Why we can't resist it. In fact, sugar is addictive because it works on the reward center of the brain, the nucleus accumbens, in the same way that cocaine, heroin, nicotine, and alcohol do. Now, there are people who say that no, there is no such thing as food addiction. There was a great debate this past year in uh, the American, uh, 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 American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. Um, on the European side, they said evidence that specific food ingredients are key determinants of addictive life behave eating behavior is lacking. Okay. Whereas on the American side, highly processed food are are complex substances developed through engineering by combining reinforcing ingredients, refined carbohydrates, fat, and additives, salt, et cetera, to deliver unnaturally heightened levels of reward. In fact, we actually know that sugar is in fact addictive and it works on the nucleus accumbens to reduce pain because 
This stuff right here, this is something you find in the neonatal intensive care unit. As a pediatrician, I'm very familiar with this. It is called Sweeties. Sweeties. And what is it? It is a super concentrated sucrose solution, a 24% sucrose solution that you dip the pacifier in and then stick in the newborn boy's mouth before the circumcision because it releases endogenous opioids in that reward center to reduce pain, even in neonates. The Jews have wine, everyone else has sweeties. In fact, it has been shown that fructose and glucose act on different parts of the brain to cause changes in fullness, satiety, and hunger because fructose is addictive. And we actually have an economic version of this. It's called price elasticity. So price elasticity says, how much does a, a food uh, consumption change when the price goes up? And it turns out that if it's price inelastic, that, le that is a sign of addiction. And the th three most price inelastic items that we consume are fast food, soft drinks, and juice. In comparison, eggs, which are not addictive, are the most price elastic. So when the price goes up, people stop eating eggs. But when the price goes up on these guys, they don't stop. And the reason is because they're addictive. How about in humans? Well, in humans, the American Psychiatric Association has given us different definitions for addiction, either tolerance and withdrawal or tolerance and dependence. And here are the uh, criteria for dependence. And if you read through them real quick, what you'll notice is that sugar uh, satisfies all nine of them. And finally, now, negative impacts on society. We've shown that if we could get the uh, sugar out of people's diets at a rate of 20% reduction, which would be like a tax. Fatty liver disease, heart disease, type two diabetes, and obesity would all get better. A 50% reduction would do even more. In fact, Harvard just published a paper showing that reducing the sugar in packaged foods could improve the health of millions of people and thereby reduce insurance costs and reduce um, health care uh, uh, problems in hospitals. In fact, the International Diabetes Federation went to the G20 several years ago and told them to tax sugar to save lives and money because this was breaking the medical bank of virtually every developed and developing country around the world. Finally, if you take a look at that same um, uh, graph I showed you before, showing the increase in sugar. Now I'm going to uh, superimpose on this the percent of GDP spent on healthcare spending for the same period of time. What do you see? When processed food entered our world, that's when healthcare costs started to climb out of control. So is sugar public enemy number one? Well, trans fats used to be but we now know that, and we got trans fats out of our food back in 2013. Sugar is now public enemy number one, and appropriately so, because sugar does not meet the criteria for food. In fact, it meets the criteria for poison, an addictive poison, just like tobacco and alcohol. And for that reason, Sugar needs to come down in all of our foods and people need to be wary of the sugar consumption that they, uh, that they are engaging in, in order to be able to mitigate chronic disease. With that, I wanna thank my collaborators at UCSF. We affectionately refer to ourselves as the Sugar Hill Gang. Uh, my colleagues at UCSF Hastings College of the Law and also UCLA Resnick Center for Food Policy and Obesity. Thank you so much for your attention.